evening, everyone. So welcome to the Bharat Connect April edition of uh, panel discussion. So uh, this this time we have a very interesting topic. Um, we always talk about something to do with the customers, customer experience and everything. So this time the topic is uh, how do you create a customer centric strategy overnight? Um, is this even true, right? Uh, that that that's like you know, uh, can you can you do this kind of a thing in a like you know short duration of time? So <clears throat> let's try to find out, like you know, uh, <clears throat> based on our experience, based on the industry experience, we have a couple of good uh, panelists here to share their experience and uh, like you know, uh, help us to uh, navigate through this uh, difficult topic here. So. Let me introduce the topic a little bit more, and then uh, I'll get out, get to introduce the panelist, and then we'll get the discussion going. So uh, <clears throat> we all understand that it is impossible to create a customer-centric culture overnight. It requires a lot of effort, and customer centricity needs to be a part of organizational culture to achieve overnight uh, success. So we have reached a stage where customer prioritize experience over um, like, you know, products and pricing itself. Um, so it takes a, like, you know, a um, <clears throat> lot of effort, uh, more than just producing a good product, like you know, how to uh, make customer feel that this is the right thing for them. Like, you know, uh, so once you get that stage, th then things are different, meaning that a little bit more pricing, or like, you know, um, that, that is not the big thing, right? So, also you have other competitors who are trying to do the very similar product. If you take a car uh, in India, like you know, for 20, 30 years back, we had very limited uh, number of cars. Now, just imagine how many cars are on the road, how many colors, how many shape, how many uh, varieties, and uh, uh, like you know, what is the budget? Like you know, from three lakhs all the way to like you know several crores, right? So you have everything. So how do you differentiate yourself? And how do you make, um, like, you know, convince customer that, like, you know, they are getting the best. So that's the challenge we are in, right? So I want to, uh, like, share one of the little story that I encountered um, in last three, four weeks time. I my car was complaining something about uh, like you know, having a low pressure in one of the uh, tires, so I had to take it to a place where I can get it checked for a flat tire. It's not an actually flat tire, but like you know, so I had to eventually check the pressure and everything. So I'm trying to get to a place where I usually go years back, um, but they gave me an appointment like you know, five six days after essentially next week i could not wait for a week because it, this can create a problem anywhere it's like i don't want to be standard so i decided to like you know go stop by another place where uh, they were able to like you know take me in but then that gentleman was telling me like you know they had to really fix it and uh, like you know i had to change the tires and everything i said that's okay uh, let if i can like you know take my car and go today, I, I'm good. So I came out and then next week, I decided to stop by to that place where I was going to go anyway. And then meanwhile, I was getting again, a little bit of low pressure and complaint. So I go stop by here. This is one of the reporter place. And then they take my car and then like, you know, uh, I sit there for two hours and uh, nobody, <laughs> They're even talking to me, like, you know, and then I was going there and then, uh, like, uh, trying to get more information what's going on. I see the car came after me are getting serviced and why not mine? And then after a while, um, like, you know, the, the one, one of my known faces coming up there, like, you know, uh, and then he tells me, uh, like, you know, sir, we are, we are uh, looking into a situation. Uh, what is the situation? Uh, we don't know where we uh, placed your key. By any chance, do you have your car key with you? I said, no, I gave my car key uh, already to that person. Like a you know, lady was sitting on the counter. I gave it to her. And yeah, here I am waiting for two hours. That's a problem. So we are still locating. Please don't panic anything. Like, you know, we are trying to figure out, like, you know, it should be somewhere here. Like, you know, we'll get it sorted out. And then... After 15, 20 minutes, they said they found it and then they got it uh, fixed and everything. And then he came to me and then I said, like, you know, uh, 
uh, yeah, yeah, here is my card, like, you know, please charge. And then like, you know, I had to go. And then the, like, you know, the, the, the way he uh, like, you know, explained the ex uh, the situation that time like you know was uh, really the highlight of the point i'm trying to stress so he said i'm extremely sorry for what happened and this should not have happened to begin with but it did happen so i don't know how do i like you know uh compensate your time and everything so it is not fair for me to uh, charge you anything at all uh because you spent more time than what you're supposed to and i know you have been here like you know probably 10 years ago not in recent time but still you are my customer so i do want to like you know uh, keep a good relationship with you and on top of it um, like you know you don't have to pay anything to me today it is really unfair for me to charge you anything at all and i'm going to give you a 50 dollar um like you know uh, certificate uh, if any case, in case anything happens, anything like, you know, stop over, like, you know, we are here to help and uh, make sure like, you know, this is not uh, like, you know, we'll give you the better experience next time. And why I'm saying is, uh, think about the situation where it happened, right? So it, it became a challenge, right? It became a frustration at some point as a customer. And then how do you handle that situation? How do you make that situation into your advantage or like you know making sure like you know customer can still be satisfied even at that kind of a worst uh, case scenario that that's that's how it's all about being a customer centric i would think right it's not a uh, 50 dollars gift certificate that uh, made me happy it was actually not at all i would have been happy after he talked to me uh, he uh, like you know took my uh like um, uh, whatever the payment i was supposed to make i would have been even more happier the, the reason is the way how he explained to me how he connected with me that's what makes a difference right um because that is the feel you want to leave to your customer uh whereas the other place like you know he was trying to sell one more tire right uh sir your tire is really really bad condition you have to change and then this gentleman is telling me there is no need to change this anytime soon i would see at least like you know nine months like a year you are fine so please go ahead and like you know anything happens come back don't worry about changing that right now so it's not just selling one more product but now what you have sold is like you know you have sold experience to your customer which means it's not like selling one tire now you can sell many 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 more tires right because now i am talking about it right if i'm talking about it in this panel i would have talked about it to many of my friends and like you know they would have made that decision to go back to them things like that so this is this is what we are talking about uh today okay so with that introduction of the topic let's like you know let me introduce and bring our panelists here so first I'll start with Pradeep Sridharan. So Pradeep is a business leader with experience in sales, strategy, service delivery, and operations management. Pradeep truly believes in the coming together of technology and customer needs. He currently functions as a CEO of Unlimit, a Reliance Group company. He had stints with like you know, Verico, uh, Ordeo, and uh, Indosat, and like you know many many different companies so we welcome uh pradeep to you you to this discussion and uh, we are like you know more than willing to like you know uh, spend a lot more time to and learn from your experience thank you so much for being here thank you very much and uh, the next panelist is anil um anil sanaradi so anil is a co-founder and of and head of technology at Zuzi Systems, he understands the software development lifecycle from ideation to execution and ensures customer delight at Zuzi Systems. His forte is B2B space, and we look forward to hearing his perspective on customer centricity. Welcome, Anil, to this panel. Thank you so much, sir, for being here with us. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you, sir. And I have, uh, thank I have. Uh, Pradeep also, thank you very much, Pradeep. Yeah, so we supposed to have one more uh, gentleman here, Balakrishnan, he's not able to join uh, for personal reasons. So so it's going to be bit, like you know, just three of us. So let, like, you know, let's get this started. So the discussion points, like, you know, so this is not uh, just to like, you know, um, 
uh, stop you anywhere to like, you know, talk about what they said. It is more of a, like, you know, starting point. I would rather put it uh, that way. At least these are the main topics we want to touch base on for today's uh, discussion. So that way we believe we can bring more, uh, like, you know, uh, pointers for our audience, right, of community. So let's, like, you know, start with, like, you know, both of you, you can go, okay. So that, can we take a moment to define customer centricity and how it is practiced in your organization? So Pradeep or like, you know, uh, Anil, whoever wants to go first, so, yeah. No, Anil, you want to start or? Uh, you can take it, sir. I'll wait. All right, okay, no problem, yeah. sir. Now, <clears throat> see, so welcome to all the other participants who are here. And thank you, Tamana, as well as Anil. Uh, I think the definition of customer centricity is of less importance, I'm sure, because everyone knows that one. But I think uh, how we practice that in an organization is very critical. And, you know, Tamana mentioned about this one saying that, how do you plan for something like that? Now, I don't think that somebody can overnight plan for it because uh, it's not possible. You have to really go through the journey itself in terms of doing it. That's my uh, experience for that matter. I think one of the key things in terms of building a customer centric organization is about uh, the management or the, the whole thing coming from the top. It's the narrative, the, the, the feeling, uh, the, the act in every single moment of the journey from the management downwards to the last person having customer in the heart of the conversation. I think that's extremely critical. And I think the onus lies back with the managing director or the CEO, whoever it is, to tell constantly, communicate constantly, and showcase constantly that customer centricity is critical to the business. And every action which we are doing is with customer in the heart of the whole thing. That's one part of it. I think it's also important to uh, involve the teams in terms of the engagement. Now, for example, when we talk about customer centricity, you may have all the customer facing teams, be it sales, marketing, customer service, all the three teams or whichever other teams are there. Everyone has to be involved in this conversation. Now, you, we cannot put across a position saying that, okay, these are the targets for customers, you know, experience what we, put, what we are putting across and you want to abide by it. That won't necessarily work. You need to ensure that you're winning hearts and minds on the whole thing through your actions. And that's number one, which means that you need to involve people. Number two would be in terms of, you know, I would normally tend to invest more on the sales as well as the customer service because those become the two, they become the tip of the sphere, sphere in terms of the engagement with the customer. So invest in these functions from a training standpoint, also to have that life cycle managed accordingly, very critical. Third and the most critical one would be feedbacks. I think it's very important to have the feedbacks on a constant basis. You know, I, there are people who have got challenges in terms of taking feedbacks I've seen. I will not even call criticism, I will call it critique. It's very important to have that critique on a constant basis and ensure that it goes through the typical you know, PDCA cycle, plan to check act, because the customer also should know that, that I have yeah, given the feedback, they've acted on it, and hence they have moved into a new baseline. Making sure that the customer is understanding that one, he is being made aware of it, and practicing that, make sure that you are building a, an organization which is customer centric, which the customer appreciates, the colleague appreciates, as well as the city appreciates. All the three C's will appreciate that one. Well. I think that's the three things I would say to start with. Yeah, good, good points, Pradeep. Yeah, yeah, very, very good start point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anil? Uh, definitely. Thank you, uh, Pradeep, and thank you, Uthaman. And um, so, uh, I mean, um, so with respect to uh, building customer centricity, I mean, I just want to go back to the old way of uh, uh, teaching. I mean, I would call it like somewhere like 18 or 17, 18 years ago when I started my career. Um, we would used to have this word called customer is God. I mean, I think it, it would still apply. I mean, probably you being as a customer is still a God when you go and stand in front of a store. Uh, similarly, your customer is going to get into the similar related terms, but um, things change. The world has changed. Um, so 
I mean, uh, from I mean, one in one input that I picked from Pradeep was like uh, the top management instilling the customer is very important is a continuous aspect from the top that should happen, but at the same time, uh, making people from the lower side should also come move towards up. Meaning, um, uh, so there is a story in terms of. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, a person going and asking who is building a cathedral. So, I mean, the lowest, uh, sorry to use the wrong words, but uh, the person who is doing the masonry work, if you ask him, like, he says that, I mean, uh, the first person says that I'm just building, I'm, I'm just laying the bricks, would be an answer that person says. The next person would definitely say that I'm building the largest cathedral in this area. So it's about how do we tell uh, the individuals or the teams that um, are the the uh, importance of customers' business and how they make an impact the world and uh, mm. how we cannot afford to make any mistakes. I mean, knowingly or unknowingly, as much possible. That's one. That's the second aspect. This is more towards how to create the awareness in terms of cus creating customer centricity. Okay. And um, um, we always have. Um, uh, the second aspect to it is like we uh, generally uh, talk about uh, if there is a mistake, um, your team member has to come and talk to you back. So, so your customer should be in a very open pace. I mean, I, I think Uthman was giving an example some time back. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably uh, a better customer centricity would help you at least a customer casually uh, pinging you and saying that, hey, can you get this done? Some kind of a freedom or a open communication channels to be to be created. Um, I, I understand that there is always a, um, a three level that you always have. One is at the top management level, management to management, call it CX to CX. Next is AM to the uh, respective line managers and the delivery to the line managers. And that's in my line of business. But there should always be a cross open communication where people are able to give inputs to the uh, the respective delivery teams and uh, um, and again uh, i want to touch on the pradeep's point in terms of uh, receiving criticism is very important um, i mean uh, that's where we do a lot of uh, constant feedback i mean i would personally uh, i mean again it's it's a personal thing also sometimes when i want to tell so i have a constant touch with my customers whichever the size of the account i talk to them like once in two weeks if there is a topic to discuss or not still there is a high that goes to them on a call so they have every freedom to you see it's it just in, it, it, it doesn't stop with work you continue to have the channel in which you try to communicate uh, the freedom is going to be uh, be there for both of you to openly talk in terms of issues and you can go towards future the thing is um I mean, that's the environment that we need to cre uh, create. And um, again, overnight, uh, it is it would not be possible, but it's it's mostly a culture that we need to bring in across the organization to tell people that uh, we are we are working towards a larger cause for our customers and how that's going to impact the business is something that we need to con continue to insist and instill to the people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah, this has to be instilled at all different levels. Like, exactly. uh, yeah, and it, and it takes time uh, to build that kind of uh, environment. And also, we should be open to give uh, employees, uh, like, you know, empower them with, uh, like, you know, um, a lot of uh, freedom in terms of, like, you know, how uh, they should go about it. Because there is, you cannot define this is what is, right? Because um, you just don't know what kind of situation you're going to face. Uh, like, you know, so who would have expected in the in the tire shop, like, and they're going to uh, misplace the key, right? I mean, if you, if, you, if you are going by a book, there is not going to be any scenario explained, like, you know, when you miss a key, you have to go talk to the customer like this. It's, it's just not going to be there. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so, like, you know, they have to be empowered. Uh, how to handle the situation and uh, yeah uh, like you know make sure that the end goal is like you know, how to keep your customers happy so uh, because that's what is going to uh, keep you in the business and... what if you went and claimed the insurance yeah <laughs> putting the liability on them saying that they have lost your key i mean yeah yeah so true okay so we'll move to the next discussion point 
So uh, Pradeep, I will, um, it, it's for you. So every product or service gets commoditized, commoditized over time. It is the experience that differentiates one from the other. To provide experience, organizations need to understand customer expectations. How do you go about understanding customer expectations? What metrics do you measure? What has and has not worked for you? Okay. Sure. So uh, if you look at uh, from a probably like an anticipation of customer expectation, right? Now. I think there is no clear cut mechanics in terms of you have a SOP written down saying that, okay, this is the way you can measure it. And I doubt that would be the case. Or a KMDB available to say that, okay, this is the knowledge management. It's where you go when you get this data, not possible, I suppose. But I think there are some softer elements which are very critical and people practice it and they master it as well. I think one of the most critical thing I say that with with a lot of responsibility of making this statement and saying that listening becomes very critical. When I say listening, it's active listening, right? And this is not a skill which people normally have taught. You know, they have, there is a bit of a challenge of the whole thing. It takes a lot of time and a little bit of patience and a lot of learning to get into active listening. I think that helps you in terms of anticipating the customer expectation because when you're having these conversations, you get a lot of subtle messages in the whole thing. You need to know that how you can pick that one and use it effectively. That's number one, which helps you in terms of moving to the next step, which is knowing your customer. Very easily said, but very difficult in terms of uh, taking it forward because uh, you know, knowing your customer is a very uh, easily people say, I know the scope of work, I know what my customer requires, I'm delivering. But you may be delivering 70% of what he wants, but his real need, the difference of want and need comes near need would be something a little bit different. And that is not what you are you know, able to cater to. That becomes an issue. I think these two elements becomes very critical in anticipating. And uh, the third and the most important thing, I'll say that there has to be a usage of technology, you know, innovation and technology. There are a lot of CRM tools and things like that available in terms of measuring all the matrices which is currently available. All the tools will give you a lot of data. I think the most critical part of the story is that how you are analyzing the data, you're taking some meaningful insights out of the whole thing and correlating that back with the insights you have collected from the listening, which I've mentioned before, and coming out with an action plan and ensuring that action plan is delivered. Yeah. Right. So that, that becomes very important. Again, I'm saying that it's very easy to, for me to say it. Uh, very difficult for myself who is preaching this in this forum to practice it. It's not easy. Very many times we also waver from the whole thing. Timelines get compromised. We miss things. All those things happen. But I think these measures has been very helpful in terms of doing it. Now, the matrices what which we typically look into. Uh, you have all the standard API matrices. I'm sure that everyone in customer service or customer centricity related conversations will be looking into. I think that one of the key things which I look at from a customer satisfaction part of it would be my increase in wallet share from that customer. Okay, This is again a probably a provocative or a controversial statement but in which people say that, okay, how can you have an emotional, uh, a measure of an emotional thing on the back of a dollar value? But going back to Uttaman's example itself on the tire part of the story, if you are going back to the same tire shop and if you are even buying it or you're doing the service from that place, I know that one, you know, you, I'm still able to connect with you emotionally well and I'm able to get more business from you. So for me, my measure is that customer delight definitely is a key measure. There are a lot of matrices available, but a quantitative measure for me always would be that, am I continuing with the customer, you know, without any churn or an erosion from a call value standpoint? And am I able to have increasing valid share? I mean, that would be the normal way which I try to do things, which has been fairly helpful, I should say. That's number one. Where it has not worked, most of the places it has worked. Where it has not worked also, I will tell you. Uh, there are, you know, in the, specifically in the IoT business, what we are talking at this point in time. Uh, repeat businesses may not be possible at all. You know, there are situations where in which people have given, they have, they wanted to have optimization of resources uh, which is to be done, which is IoT is a lever in terms of doing it. Now that optimization has been done, I may continue with the contract or maybe the first phase of my stuff is done, I move away from it. 
from that engagement. I may probably go back into that one at a later date. And I know that you know I'm not going to get a repeat business in five years or seven years or 10 years sort of stuff. In those places, we may have to have the metrics, which is fundamentally of a delight part of the story where we know that the customer is happy. You know, we provide consulting services, you know, engagements of that nature and to ensure that the customer is always kept warm. Maybe at some point in time, it will come back. So, you know, those areas, it becomes a little bit difficult for us to do it. Uh, where I come from, from a telecom background part of it, we have been always successful on the back of dollar value, you know, increasing value share for, you know, as a, as a key metrics for that, for that matter. I mean, that would be my initial views. Uh, I'm more than happy to take or go deeper into any of the pointers which I mentioned or something which I missed as well. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think you have covered uh, for the most part. Yeah. That, that's that's a good point, actually. So, yeah. Um, many a times, like, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not going to be like in a clear cut. This is the way, that's the way or anything. But, uh, yeah. So, being more proactive and, uh, like, you know, looking for different avenues and, uh, like, you know, how you can um help make them comfortable like you know so they come back to you for different solutions so many times what happens is uh, they come back to you with a requirement probably you are not even uh, like you know uh, thinking about doing that right so you would hear that requirement for a first time it's okay right because um, it might uh, be a good idea for you to look at that is it is it a good idea for me to like you know expand into that requirement is that like you know going to align with my other business objective and uh, like you know maybe this is what the future is going to be all about and uh, like you know so maybe i have to look into this uh, like you know to keep it uh, more attractive for my other customers as well right Th that happens many a times right because we go with a, a set of um, idea and um, like you know this is what is uh, like you know requirement for the from the whole world and this is what I'm going to produce and then like you know uh, world is going to uh, like you know uh, consume my products and services but then like you know the customer can come back and then uh, give you an entirely different kind of uh, like a you know, thought process hey your what you're doing is good but like you know I was looking at this way um like you know uh can you do it and uh, so yeah so many a times it's a wake-up call uh, so companies who are uh very adaptive like you know what you're saying is like you know listening part right so that if you don't listen you cannot be adaptive right and uh, you cannot even see if you don't adapt uh you are going to be obsolete, uh, like, you know, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, in, in, the, in the recent times, we have seen uh, companies who have grown tremendously, companies who have shrunk tremendously in short amount of time, right? Because the information, how we consume the information have changed. Um, like, you know, it is not a, just a daily newspaper in the morning or the evening that carries the news anymore, right? It is uh, spread across the world uh, at uh, any point of time, and uh, like you know, everyone has access to it, and um, so they and they can react to it uh, like you know more quicker than what you would anticipate. So you have to be more uh, nimble, and you have to be more uh, like you know um, adaptive to that kind of a scenario, right? So yeah. So a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's just like uh, riding a car or a bike on a road. So uh, you, I mean, uh, you you cannot ever like take your hands off of a steering wheel. You have to be constantly like you know maneuvering it, even if it is a, a straight road, right? So for that matter. So yeah, Th thanks for that, Pradeep. So. Um, like you know the next point like you know um we can go uh for both of you and then i'll the, after that i'll go to uh, one specific question for anil so the next question uh, the point discussion point is do you personalize your offerings for your customers can you give some examples of how it works in your organization so uh, anil uh, you want to go first yeah sure definitely uh, thank you Adam. So I think I, I wanted to uh, slightly touch uh, the previous point uh, to uh, connect with the uh, the third question. And yeah. I think uh, there was a good elaboration from Pradeep. Uh, and uh, um, every service becomes commoditized or, I mean, you make money out of it, not from day one, it matures basically. Yeah. So uh, in the business that we are today, I mean, mostly on the uh, services side, IT services, Let's call it like when we started, 
someone asks you for a developer, we would have started having a lead developer sit down and tell, ask customer what he wants and see, okay, we'll get this more from a technology standpoint and give it a hand to you. That's where we started. So later on, what happened is like, you 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 see customers who who has call it, call it like one liner two liner kind of thoughts. I mean, let's say this is my business value for next year for this year to build something out. So then we started involving a business analyst. So saying that hey, let's chart down whatever the customer wants and see how we can uh, look at it more from a uh, product. I mean, why don't we look at their pain point and make it our pain point and look at things. That's the second aspect of it. Yeah. And the third one is how this how this person is going to sell to the market is another thing. So these are various aspects in which we look at. I mean, it's more from a consulting angle. Um, not just you ask to develop a software, we develop. It's about it's a maturing aspect, a maturing aspect. Yeah. So that's how it starts. I mean, now. Coming back to the the recent question that you asked, more in terms of, do we personalize our offerings uh, for the organization? Yes. So, um, it could be like I mean, the personalization can happen based on the markets, based on the company, um, uh, based on uh, uh, the uh, uh, the ability to spend also. Uh, so it could be different uh, aspects. I mean, let's say. Um, Based on the markets, some customers might say that I will have you only as part of my team kind of conversation that my, we might go with. Some customers might ask for an end-to-end solutioning. That's where we would fit in very well as a company. We, we do a lot of solutioning and take it until delivery to support. And uh, the, uh, the last in terms of uh, helping these customers in giving ideas. So uh, we work with a lot of customers in building their MVPs, I mean, meaning minimum viable products, I mean, which will help them to put themselves in the market. So uh, we we help them to first get the product done in parallel while we, while we are working on this, we, we talk to them about how do you get your marketing control done? Who are your target customers? What, I mean, if I were you, I would do like this. Probably is there a way we can help you to get some references for you to go to the market? So it's about how you wanted to bridge this offerings together sometimes because so one, uh, you are helping them not just as a technology partner, you might more be more of a advisory also. I mean, end of the day, you, you, you are going to make some revenue also out of it. I mean, which means that um, then the person thinking about how the product is going to look like, uh, the customer can start focusing on his business aspect while you help them to build the product for them. So things yeah. like that. It's about how do you offer varies with the customer because uh, um, most of the cases, uh, I think your reference might go with most of the SaaS or a, um, um, or a turnkey kind of solutions where you basically uh, pay per use or you go for deployment, right? So, yeah. but in terms of services, it has to be a custom offering. That's how I would like. To present yeah. my thought. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, Anna. Yeah, Pradeep. Yeah. All right. Let let me let me add a few interesting colors into this one. Maybe it's interesting. Let's see. Yeah. You know, in our typical, you know, telecom solution, IoT technology, IT, all those things. You know, I'll probably try to put this in three buckets. One bucket is the product stack, right? You know, the products and services. You have always a standard product standard solution which the customer is ready to buy off the shelf. I'm not going to change anything. SLS are standard, everything is standard. You take it and that's what you get. Mm -hmm. Then you have standards products, bespoke solutions. I have done 20, 25% at best customization for your own benefit and I've given to you. So it's a standards product, bespoke solution. Then I have a complete bespoke solution, you know, in terms of turnkey solutions, like Anil mentioned. So it's a complete bespoke solution. Now, if you map that one across, you know, the amount of personalization which goes in, it will be sort of inversely proportional. The standard product standard solution will have very specifically intrinsic sort of like personalization only, but in which I'm building a relation with you. I'm sort of like talking humane and friendly, things like that. 
the moment it goes into more of solutioning sort of flavor, it's completely bespoke solution. I would be having very extrinsic supports as well, like the way you're getting into consulting. I'm going to tell you how I can help you to sell better so that, you know, I become part of your journey. I handhold you through the across the value chain for that matter, so on and so forth. Right. So uh, personalization is critical, but you know what happens is they need to be very sure what you're personalizing it to. If the customer, you know, our normal objective is to see that how a standard product standard solution guy who's sitting in the extreme left essentially moves through this journey to the right side of the stuff where we create more value to him and at the same time make more dollar for us as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, that's the way I will call it. And there are various measures. In principle, would be, as I said, being humane and friendly, email, chat, talk, whatever the case is. Other ones would be you will have consulting based conversations, you will have market research based information, you would be analysis based information, you can you know, provide various other things according to his business requirements. And he's helping, you are helping him to grow, and you're expecting that, you know, he probably provide the same favor back on you. So it becomes a, you know, it's sort of like a joint sort of growth for the parties will, will, will have in a, in a, in a last journey. That was something I like to add into. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good point. So um, I will, I will add one more here. Um, this just happened last week. Um, so we are being in a SaaS, right? So um, um, our model is like, you know, to have a product and then like uh, customers come and subscribe and there are a lot of customization uh, like, you know, that can be done for that, for each one of them. And then like, you know, literally different reports and uh, like, you know, deployment and different integrations, everything. So uh, we really did not have uh, like, you know, uh, any situation where we had to have uh, like a dedicated, um, like, you know, a person uh, uh, like you know to be there to uh, get them started uh, like you know we are we are there in like, over 20 years so we are always able to like you know, get them started and going like you know uh, uh, pretty much they can do themselves or like you know uh, with a little help and uh, like you know it is never a case like you know we had to have a dedicated person so it's interesting enough like you know uh, last week we have encountered one uh, customer uh, like you know they are international but like you know um, sitting in India and then making international calling. So uh, like, you know, the CEO calls me and then says like, you know, um, do you have a uh, like a support engineer who can be uh, in our office and like, you know, uh, for the deployment, like, you know, in the April 1st week, uh, and then I asked him like, you know, uh, we have a support engineers, but like, you know, we, we do that uh, like uh, most of the time the remote, like, you know, we didn't have to go in person, but then he said, no, uh, I need somebody here. Uh, like, you know, I have certain uh, things to be done. And and then he explained me what, what it was. And then like, you know, so and then like, you know, when he explained that a comment, like, you know, I thought, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I understood his concerns, what, what, like you know what, what where he is going uh what he is going towards and like you know why he needs somebody in person so i said okay that's fine so so we have a person uh sitting in their office this week which you have never done in 20 years right so why i'm mentioning is like you know you, you got to be able to adapt to what is uh, the market reality and why they ask for it and like you know so you have to have a good communication to understand why is it and then like, you know, uh, go along with that, right? Because you don't have to say yes for everything, but you have to say yes to like, you know, um, uh, for a for a good reason, for a good cause. You can, you mean, you cannot say, uh, you know, no to it because uh, like, you know, it, it's, it's not a good idea because um, like, you know, it has to be, uh, we are, uh, we have a product or service uh, at the end of the day to be used by somebody and uh, who is going to use and uh, like, you know, they have some recommend, you have to meet those recommends. Otherwise it's, it's not going to uh, like, you know, uh, be doing any good for them or us. So, yeah. Okay. So the next uh, discussion point, uh, this is Anil, this is for you. Um, you collect customer feedback through surveys interviews and one-on-one -on -one conversations what do you do with them how do you convert customer feedback into insights how do you make them actionable for different functions within your organization um, sure definitely uh, thanks for the question Uttam. um so uh, we uh, we as an organization is more uh, towards quality compliance. I mean, uh, we are a SOC certified. I mean, just to demark in terms of how we approach the problem. 
Okay. So with respect to customer feedback, there are two aspects to it. One uh, is um, every customer, every, uh, we call it as an account. Say for instance, I mean like today, um, um, for instance, I mean just the name comes because of uh, Pradeep being here. Call it Reliance is our customer. Yeah. So Reliance has an account manager. So if that's the case. So the account manager meets the customer, will ensure to meet the customer as often as possible and call it like once in a quarter or once in a month. That's the frequency is left to the person. That's one. And we have a monthly um, all hands meeting with the customer leadership and our leadership. This is the second level. This is more of a visible feedback that you get. I mean, which means that there could be hidden items which you, I mean, uh, which the customer does not want to tell. I mean, we don't want to have that culture, but still, I mean, there could be some, we don't know that. So, yeah. so these feedback, I mean, there are, these are different ways of getting feedback. And the third one is in terms of, we do service with the customers every quarter, additionally. So yeah. the service would be on multiple aspects, deliverables, people, uh, coordination, technology, uh, consulting, value add, different aspects to it. So based on which what happens is we uh, open up a feedback loop across the account and the delivery managers. So we ensure that we uh, mitigate, uh, I, mean, I would call it, I mean, uh, identify the root cause. If there is a, uh, on a, on a scale of five, if something is more, uh, if, the, if something is less than four, uh, we definitely have to start looking into it, even if it's 3.9 per se. And if it goes, I mean, if it is beyond uh, four and absolutely if you get a five, we definitely have to have a, a lunch for team appreciating them and uh, giving appreciations on uh, the internet portal in multiple ways. One is, see, finding faults is one side of the thing and, and fixing it. The other one is how do you make it as part of the culture? So making it part of the culture happens only when you promote, encourage, appreciate people. So that's something that we we look at on both the aspects. It's not just the negatives are being taken care with some root cause and fix them. The positive should also be appreciated and promoted across the organization. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, good point, Anu. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, with that, like, you know, that brings us to like, you know, the, the last discussion point, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, for both of you, uh, customer centricity is about being proactive, which must be part of your organization's culture. How do you bring that in as a part of your culture? Can you share some examples? Yeah, I mean, I can pick it. I mean, I think uh, uh, I was mentioning uh, uh, initially, I think uh, th this point goes back goes back to what uh, Pradeep has mentioned uh, from top uh, top to bottom as an approach. I mean, where uh, the essence of customer centricity has to be explained or repeated by the top management continuously. That's one. Uh, that's definitely uh, uh, given because uh, unless there is a noise made by uh, the topmost people. Uh, it doesn't get embedded. That's one side of the thing. There's another uh, thing where you we should empower people telling them uh, the overall cost you are uh, working for. I mean, I mean, let's say if you work for a bank, I mean, you cannot tell that I'm doing something like a software development or a unit testing, but rather we should talk about a feature that's going live. So let's say, what is the importance of that feature or how this customer is going to help uh, multiple businesses. I mean, just to give an example, we uh, I don't want to give the names, but there's something called syndication in today's banking world, meaning like multiple banks can come and yeah. give loans to the individuals or businesses. So sometime in 2015 or 16 kind of times when, I, uh, when we started uh, Shuchi, we were building for one of the banks, uh, this syndication module where um, where we were doing with full interest, but we ensured to communicate amongst us that something that hasn't been available in India at that point of time, or maybe it is not very evident that you, I mean, when a bank was, it was affordable to deliver something for at a 20% of what someone asked, there were other syndicators who came forward and ensured to fulfill up to 80 to 90%. So this is going to make 
more businesses to survive and that is going to create employment. It's about how we feel about a feature, which is very important. So I think that's how we can start promoting and empowering the, uh, uh, let's call it 17 years ago, I was the lowest band. So call it someone like me would have, has always been uh, pushed or made me feel good about with similar aspects. I mean, that's what I would like to call it as, uh, I mean, how do you make it um, customer centric, more uh, viable option? The other one is, of course, it is proactive. It's not that uh, uh, you get a, you do a good job, then you uh, appreciate people and make that, that, okay, when I do a good job, I get an appreciation, so I should do something. Rather, tell that when we proactively act for the customer's behalf, we're going to make good for both us and the customer as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Really? So um, I think I'll also probably, as you wanted an example, you know, uh, probably I'll take something with the banking side itself. Now it is very old, so it's very easy to tell names as well for that matter. No issue with that. This is way back in 2008 when uh, Merrill Lynch was taken over by Bank of America. Now, um, I was running a team which was handling entire Asia Pac operations for uh, uh, Merrill Lynch. Uh, for their mission critical applications and basically multiple other banks like Standard Chartered and people like that. Now, one of the biggest challenges we found when, you know, when Merrill Lynch was taken over by Bank of America was that the expectations what Merrill Lynch have had from a customer service vis-a-vis -vis what Bank of America had was completely different because Merrill Lynch is largely an investment bank sort of player. And Bank of America has got all the entire, you know, set of bouquet of products available for them from retail banking and so on and so forth. As we are responsible for both, and suddenly Bank of America comes into the picture, their expectation is that even the Merlin should function in that manner. And I have a dedicated team which runs from level one to level two to level three, which manages the whole thing from incident management to restitution for that matter. So our challenge was that we are not able to make the Merlin people or the guys who are sitting in the Merlin desk across the board to make them appreciate this difference. Because for them, it is always, they work for ML for years together. They have a timeline available. They have from incident start to the incident closure. They know that how it works, but the expectations are probably 50 to 70% more aggressive than what it is. So we have to have a cultural change on the whole stuff. So what we started with them was something, you know, we, we started with trainings first, you know, in terms of telling them saying that, what is Bank of America asking you to do? It's basically a mission critical application, which means that when you have your stock markets open in various parts of the world, you know, this app is going to help you help them in terms of ensuring that the people who are connected onto it is able to respond to their requirements in, you know, milliseconds. And your response is getting delayed is, is actually washing away thousands of dollars. Okay, that making them appreciate the impact of that one was the first thing. So that also made them appreciate the fact that, oh, I'm not doing a normal, you know, once in a blue moon investment activity, which is supposed to come and I'm building the whole thing behind it. It is mission critical. It is something like, you know, it's, you know, a live or die sort of situation. Number one, the trainings really work there. Then we started building customer champions out of that one. So we said that, you know, you will have customer champions. We built, a, you know, one or two guys who are like very good, which helps the train the trainer sort of stuff. And they started owning the customer, which made the Bank of America guys feel that, okay, these guys are really doing something about it. And they are constantly taking feedbacks. They're working on it, going back to them. They have these calls and things like that. And then, then we started getting into multiple, you know, informal models in terms of FGDs, focus group discussions, sometimes with the, you know, senior management people within the operations team, my head of functions, I asked them to come over to take them for a breakfast meeting, talk them about the learnings of the whole stuff, so on and so forth, which constantly instilled with them saying that, okay, this is eight hours, you're going to be on the desk, you are going to sit on the hot seat, you are going to make a change in somebody's life when you're doing something, right? That took us a lot of communication efforts in all forms to ensure that that change in the culture happened for that matter. I remember probably it would have taken four months plus of constant engagement for us. And we continued that for a long time, the customer champion mechanics and constantly communicating. You know, obviously we all know that we don't um, admonish in public. We always admonish in private and appreciate in public. 
you know, and that appreciation in public has to be, the decibel level has to be, you know, multiplied multi many number of times to ensure that it really goes down into the, into the bone of the person. So a combination of activities like that really turn the customer in one side. They're saying that, okay, these guys are doing very well. They're active, they change, flexible, nimble, you know, empowered set of people for that matter. And the other side, the, the engineers who are sitting in all levels, experienced people to, you know, people who are in level one or in the, in the first and call center sort of stuff, they all started feeling that I am making a small change and my actions are going to make a impact on the whole thing. So it's a, it's a bit of work, but that's a, that's a great journey, which I still remember and I'm happy to share with that one. Probably I answered probably most yeah. of your questions with that example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's a good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely that that communication is what, like, you know, is a key. Otherwise, um, if, if the employees are not able to understand what you're trying to do, right? Uh, if they will not be able to appreciate who, like, you know, why they have to do certain things in a certain way. If, if that is not there, obviously they are not going to be able to like, you know, uh, work with that kind of enthusiasm, like, you know, uh, the customers who they are going to be facing because uh, uh, most of the time when a customer like, you know, reaching out to us, uh, it's not like, you know, the happy moments, right? It's, it can be uh, like, you know, a difficult moment. It can be a challenging one. It can be uh, some kind of uh, uh, issues that they are having at hand, not necessarily from our product or service, could be entirely from different product or service, but then like, you know, at the end of the day, he's not happy. So he's figuring out that any way we can do to help. So at that time, the our employees, how to be in a right mindset. Um, so I strongly believe keeping them informed with this kind of a strong communication is uh, like, you know, key to keep them like, you know, energized and uh, like, you know, keep focusing them, like you know, help them to focus on what they are trying to do. And uh, so that way, happy employee will always lead to a, like, you know, happy uh, customers, right? Um, you just cannot have a happy customers without a happy employee. It's just, it's just, just not going to work. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good so point. Just to add into that one, I mean, because it's 15 years plus old, I just had a memory of this one, probably I'll add into that one. We, we talk about how the POA ML has been supported by this change. I think one of the things which I personally believe, which I really didn't do, but my you know, the guy who was running the team who reports to me did, and I really liked him for in terms of doing it, was that we had an incident where in which his team member has actually messed it up. It was completely messed it up. Bank of America came back and said that we want the name of the person. We want to know what you guys are going to do with him. We don't want him in the team and he's responsible for it. And I see my the, the head of function walking up to me saying that this is a challenge for them and I want this person, they're asking him to leave. What do you want me to do? Uh, I said that, what's your suggestion? And he told me that, I'm responsible for it, not my team member. I will hold, I'm responsible. If you want to have penalties on it, if you want to take it, any sort of action, it is on me. I hold the line on that one. I'm responsible for it. And I said that then you talk to the customer in the same manner. Tell him saying that you are responsible for it. And then and you tell that in front of the person itself. And after some time and things cooled off, Bank of America understood and they said that yeah, trainings and other things will help him to change. But that messaging really helped the employees to believe that my leader will stand with me in thick and thin. He didn't throw him under the bus. And you know, that really, really motivated the whole. So I'm talking the both sides with how the customer part of the story and how you also protect, you know, if it is a you know, not a deliberate activity which somebody has done a mistake. You know? So just to add on to that. Yeah, yeah, you have to embrace them and they like, you know, yeah, you have to give them the freedom. That's there are gonna be some few mistakes here and there, but uh, as long as like, you know, uh, we are able to learn from those and then like you know move on that's that's more critical uh like you know, so because if you don't make a mistake like you no know, probably i'd be more worried because you are not making any progress <laughs> so so that is like you, know, you cannot be in that comfort zone like you know uh, that's especially not a good uh, good place to be okay so yeah that, that's that's good so um that brings us to the end of our all our discussion points so the audience uh like you know so i i i would like uh to remind you like you know this is a time like you know we are opening up for questions so like you know go ahead and prepare the questions and like you know uh, you can share it out with us over the chat or like you know you can uh, start asking I'm just going to like, you know, uh, go for the wrap up, uh, like, you know, uh, the meeting. So meanwhile, like, you know, you have some few minutes to prepare your questions. Okay. So um, 
today's discussion like you know we we came across a lot of different good points how uh, customer cent what is defining the customer centricity uh, what could be the strategy and uh, how we can do it and like you know and also we saw like you know why it cannot be done overnight uh, and uh, how it is to be done how long it takes and uh, how we are uh, like you know going about in getting it done and uh, how we can do it in a better way by like you know involving everybody uh, like you know right from top to the bottom how to instill that like, that kind of uh, like a thought process into the organization like you know uh, so we saw all different aspects and we saw a lot of examples in the banking examples uh, like you know and the, the tire shop where like you know so like a lo lot of different things so um there are like a lot of good points that are uh like you know we came across and i am hoping that like that's going to help our uh community and uh like you know um our audience like you know got good um information that they are looking for and uh, like you know so let's open up uh for their questions so audience uh you want to go um abdul do you have any questions with you um anybody Morning, Edmund. I have one question myself. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyone can answer this question. Uh, this basically, you know, Pradeep sir was telling me that, you know, the listening skills, right, about that, the agents. So mm -hmm. actually, I came across, you know, personally uh, with this experience. I got some, you know, issue with, uh, I have a one insurance plan with some other XYZ company, but, you know, uh, some technical issue happened. The agent was calling me and uh, she was trying to collect the payment, actually, even though there is no mistake from my end. I was very clearly telling that, you know, what went wrong? So you called me and you're saying that this is this not happened. You have to pay like that, right? I, I told you I have a amount in my account. And if you want, I can share the screenshot also. But the lady was, you know, literally not listening to anything. And uh, her main intention was, you know, Somehow she uh, wanted to convince me and she wanted to collect the payment in the call itself. Okay. So now my question is, anyway, uh, uh, I understand her, uh, you know, pressure and targets and all, but I being, you know, uh, this uh, service, customer service industry employee, I just wanted to understand from a management point of view, how the management is ensuring that the, you know, the customer support people are literally listening the customer's genuine problems see uh, there might be 100 questions or 100 problems but only you know 5% or 10% will be a genuine problems that you no know, management how uh, the people are ensuring that the ground level people are literally listening the customers uh, genuine problems and they are trying to take the right uh, action plan up you know against that issue so that you know uh, that is, ha I felt with that company, the, some expensive company, I felt that is not happening. And uh, even though I'm providing the complete information, but she is not ready to listen. And the point here is, she said that, you know, she, you know, uh, she said she will come back again. But after that, I think they are using some auto dial or something. Okay. So after one hour, again, some other person called and they asked, this, they told the same story. Again, I ended up, you know, saying the same story. But here, I my question literally is, you know, uh, how the management is making, you know, uh, make sure that you know they are they should listen the customers' problem. Yeah, and 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 more particularly, like you know, you are talking about how do you identify, like you know, it's a true problem. How uh, like you know how and uh, they get uh, like you know the proper response. Yeah. I, I will try in terms of because I don't know the problem statement, but you know from what you said, I will try to probably from a principle standpoint, I believe. Uh, we all know that the person who is going to take the first call or making the first call to you has got a an idiot book with him or her. It's a standard operating procedure. They are not supposed to think. They are supposed to act only as per the book. Right? Now, this is very important to know because I'm sure you all know what I'm just repeating it. Because the idea here is that it is, there is a cost element in terms of all these things. Now, as I briefly touched on this one in terms of your standard product, standard solution. Now, when you have a standard product, standard solution coming from a B2C standpoint, which is what Rajshekar is highlighting here, a B2C standpoint, there are so many things which goes into the conversation where the calls is actually getting into, right? Now, if it is a bank, it will be, are you a platinum customer, are you a gold customer or a different customer? If you are an airline, the same thing. If you are telecom, same thing. 
Now, the person who is going to take the call essentially has got, he has got all information about you and he will respond to that one and that's what he has been told to respond. Now, even that has been told in a similar, in a particular manner to do it, there is always a good way to handle that one where in which, you know, it is important for that agent's team lead or the manager or who is above that one empower the person a little bit beyond that one so that he's able to collect that information, give the confidence to the customer saying that, okay, I understand this is a problem statement. I'll ensure that I'm talking to my seniors on it and I'm going to come back to you by this time and he or she is passing the information and circling back to you so that you don't have to call one hour later and you, your call is getting landed into another call center person who has got no clue on it and you repeat the whole thing. Right yeah. now, you will see that one in certain places, but most of the places it doesn't happen because it's a mass activity. Right now, what happens from a feedback collection standpoint is that it is most of the time you have the multiple tools in terms of your calls are getting recorded. You have this dipstick approach in terms of some of the calls. You know, the team leader will be hearing that one and he takes inputs on it. Sometimes it misses. Sometimes it gets collected. Now. It is a very sensible and a very customer-centric organization. What they do is that they try to increase the sampling point numbers. You know, it's, it's again a cost element to the whole thing, but they increase the sampling numbers to ensure that when you are getting around, you know, 20,000, 25,000 calls in a day, like a telecom operator in from Geo or a, you know, a Natural or something like that would be like that. You know, they increase the sampling to ensure that they pick up this one and it moves back not into this desk. They move into another desk and say that call up this customer, identify the problem, solve it, and then ensure that he or she who has got a problem like the tire shop conversation with Uttar mentioned to, to ensure that the person is happy about the whole stuff. Now, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but that is the best way in terms of rather one of the best ways in terms of doing that activity. And yeah. to ensure that, uh, Rajesh has another question saying that what can be done by the person to, to handle that one? Uh, you know, I can't, don't have an answer for that matter because it's very situational. The, the I personally would have done in terms of ensuring that the person, uh, the friend, frontline agent has got a little bit more empowerment in terms of the activity so that he doesn't work as a robot by, just by the SOP, but goes a little bit into the humane element part of the story, ensure that the team leader is aware of that one and circles back to the, the person of person who has got a race concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. So um we are we are going a little bit over time. So I hope it's okay with both of the panelists. So uh we already got two more questions. We I'll, I'll quickly uh, go over them. Um one question is from Arif, I guess. Yeah. Um Pradeep talked about personalization. So I have one question to him. How do you balance personalization with privacy concerns and ethical considerations? Very wide and you know, pro dangerously provocative question <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> now, you know, I, I, I'm sure you know you would have remembered in Arif that I mentioned about uh, uh, how personalization would be provided for the various or the three buckets what we have. Now. The highest level of personalization goes on the solutioning part of the story, right? as I mentioned before. Now, it's very important to ensure that the personalization which uh, is being done, which is largely from a consulting standpoint, is, is done with the customer accepting that you are providing a consulting to that person. Okay. What I mean by that is that you're not giving free consulting, free not from a commercial standpoint, but the customer should appreciate the value of what you're going to give to them. You know, it's not like you jump into that a, a business requirement document and say that I'm going to fix it for you. No, it has to be a evolved conversation to ensure that you're being part of the whole thing, but in which your, your borderlines are very clearly, you know, signed up with that person. Now, if you are having a long-term engagement, which is a solution-related one, a bespoke solution which you're working on, for example, I can I can tell you, I used to support a customer in 2005 when I was heading, I was a service delivery um, head for uh, you know cable and wireless, which was taken over by Vodafone, you know, it's, it's again a multi-billion dollar business, and I was supporting the customer of Hindustan Lever. I used to sit in the levers premises for that matter. Now, uh, the thing is that. Hindustan Levers, uh, they have a separate business. Their business is obviously they're from CG part of the story. We are businesses to see that how their network is functioning absolutely fine, you know, in terms of their vans and their connectivities and all those things. Now, it, 
downtime of my network essentially creates logistic issues for them, right? Now, I have gone to them multiple number of times and told them saying that, okay, can I understand your business beyond than what you have told me to do? And if, the, if HLL has told that, no, you are supposed to just deliver what you have been given, I will never be, I should not be giving anything more to them because it is very proprietary information, their own design, their own networks, their, their, their own logistic solutions, so on and so forth. But on the contrary, the people came back and said that, okay, we will help you. We want to tell you more about how our business works. And when they say that one, then I'm giving my opinion. And then I know my borderlines very clearly. And in one case, they actually came back and said that apart from the network part of the story, we have signed NDAs and things like with you. We want to sign more with you to ensure that we want your team to help us in terms of designing certain solutions which enhances our supply chain management. So we signed paperwork with them to support that case. I mean, that would be one example I could quote, quote from my you know, limited understanding to see that how we can protect both the parties' interest and we are not providing something that the values, other person is not seeing value in the whole. I don't yeah. know whether I answered it, but uh, that's the best I could uh, think about. Uh, that's a, yeah, yeah, I think you, you are you are addressing the right point. Yeah, that's that's good one. Yeah, so, so um, like, you know, there is one more question from Vineet. I think with that, we'll conclude this one, okay? So uh, his question is, hi, panel, uh, regarding uh, the last point of the discussion, I think he is talking about the one that pre the previous one from Raj Shaker about protecting the team member uh, by the team leader for his mistake. Uh, does it not promote a bad uh, behavior in the team, especially the other team members? I think um, um, before Anil, I'll answer that question because I pointed that <laughs> point as my personal experience. Uh, I'll say yes and no. Uh, I am more favorably to a no. I'll tell you why. Uh, primarily because when the team leader is protecting his team member, it is very important to ensure that not only the team member is made aware of that one, but the wider team and to some extent the larger management is also made aware of the one. And that communication is very important to ensure that the reason why this person has been protected by the team leader is genuine and it was an accidental mistake for that stuff, lack of training, lack of whatever it is for that stuff, and it is not a habitual offender issue. That communication is extremely critical to ensure that it doesn't become a behavioral stuff. But if I'm actually bringing that person inside the room and say that, don't worry, mate, I will handle that one, you just sit quiet, and then he goes scot free. And as you all know, that when there is a lack of information, it's always considered as you know a negative thing. So people will create stories. It will become negative. It will be a negative break point by itself. And absolutely spot on in terms of what you said, it drives a very different negative behavior, wherein which they know that one, okay, I can do whatever it is. My team leader will not throw me under the bus. And that's going to be extremely dangerous in terms of customer service. And that's all from my side. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, true. I th yeah, I, I would agree to like, you know, more than the uh, giving option to uh, like a feed into more bad behavior. I think we have to give some um, like a freedom for the like you know, floor level employees, like, you know, to uh, make that kind of a connection and uh, make that kind of a decision and uh, like, you know, uh, to go a little bit out of the way to try to help. And in that process, like, you know, there is a chance that like, you know, there can be some uh, mistakes here and there, but which is okay. But uh, yeah, uh, we, we have to be able to like, you know, stand up and protect those. Otherwise, uh, they will go back into the box, which means uh, like, you know, following the strict standards and uh, that can lead to uh, like, you know, uh, definitely not a happy customer. So that that's, that's definitely uh, a concern there, yeah. Okay, so with that, like, you know, we are coming to conclude um, our session for today. So I would like to thank one more time, uh, Pradeep, for your time and like, you know, taking um, your uh, time from your busy schedule and uh, being with us. Like, you know, we greatly appreciate. And Anil, like, you know, as usual, um, thanks so much for your time. And uh, like, you know, so we learned a lot from your experience and uh, looking forward to, like, you know, talking to both of you in different sessions, either panel or sometime we do one-on-one -on -one interview and uh, sometime like, you know, so we have in-person uh, uh, meetings also. We are starting to do quarterly in a uh, different, different cities. And uh, so, uh, like, you know, so we'll be in touch and uh, like, you know, we'll see how we can collaborate more and uh, like, you know, bring your, uh, like, you know, thoughts and your experience to the community and how we can help them overall. Thank you so much, sir. Have a, have a good evening. Thank you very much.
Appreciate thank you very it. much, Pratish, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great talking. Thank you all. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.